it, sometimes I consider myself to be fortunate and then at other times I consider myself to be unfortunate because this is probably one of the most um, overwhelming issues that the swine industry is facing today. And to be part of this, it's extremely, um, it, it's really fun. But on the other hand, um, to watch the changes that are occurring because people are letting the activists as well as their emotions drive the changes is really disturbing to me, especially as a scientist. And so hopefully by the end of my presentation today, I'll give you some ideas of what's happening out there, what seems to be working, and why we probably haven't made more progress than we need. Um, I'm still a um, firm believer that the stall can be improved and that producers should have choices. That if they want to manage their sows in um, groups, they should be able to do that. If they want to manage them in an individual pen system, they should be able to do that as well. And I think part of the problem is that for so long as an industry, we've kind of tap danced around this issue and ignored it. And now it's just at the, it's at the forefront. And the main reason it's at the forefront is because it's become an emotional issue. Okay? So is, is the stall or the crate, uh, the, is that issue really about welfare? Okay? Um, as many of you know, in, in the 1960s and the 1970s, we moved to indoors. And by about the mid-90s, the majority of those individual um, environments consisted of sows being kept in crates or tethers. And we moved indoors for good reasons. And we adopted this individual stall system for good reasons. However, more recently, there's been a lot of pressure to, pressure to change. And this has been promoted mainly by humane activists in the niche market. Okay? And there's been a lot of resistance to change. Therefore, the humane activists have now, there's no federal law on how we should keep gestating sows. So the activists have taken another turn. They're doing state-by-state -state referenda, which they've been very successful at. Um, they've, we had bans in Florida, Arizona, Oregon. There's um, legislation on California, as many of you might be aware. Um, Colorado just recently announced a voluntary phasing out. And then, of course, we have the market savvy producers that have also caused this new phenomenon of phasing out the um, individual stall and moving into a group housing situation. This started about a year ago, 2007, when Smithfield made their announcement that they were going to phase out the crate system and move to a um, group housing system. Okay. So what is this major issue? It's the two by seven individual crate. Okay. The main problem with this, according to those that have an issue with the two by seven individual crate, is that the sow cannot turn around or she cannot socially interact. The activists will go one step further and tell you that this two by seven crate causes this extremely intelligent animal to develop compulsive behaviors. In 1997, when the EU started to implement their new laws, this was primarily based on opinion. Okay? It was a group of vet veterinarians that decided that sows needed to exercise and they needed to engage in investigatory behaviors. Okay? This is the same thing that's happening in the United States, that the activists are, activists are extremely motivated to eliminate the stall housing system. However, as a scientist, as of today, there are no alternatives that we can say that truly improves the well-being of the sow. In 2004 and 2005, there were two re review papers that came out and said that no one system is clearly better than the other. The individual stall system, one of the reasons that it became an acceptable system is that you could manage the feeding of the sow, the individual sow. It reduced aggression. A pregnant sow is a different beast. I know that genetics will also affect that, but many of you are aware that there are certain genetic lines that are much more aggressive than other genetic lines. But there is something about that pregnant sow that makes her very different. It was the ease of management and it provided an opportunity for better utilization. You could have more sows in a building. 
That's the economic factor of it all. A lot of times the decisions that producers have made have been basically in the past based on economics. What is the issue? The issue is that m most sows don't fit in the standard two by seven. Um, it does limit socialization and it limits movement. However, do we know whether that sow really needs that socialization and whether d does she really need to turn around? Okay. In my opinion, if this issue was truly about welfare, then an optimized stall system as well as an optimized group system would be an acceptable choice. Okay. It is true that today's sow cannot turn around, she cannot lie down in full recumbency, and she does have limited social interaction. So if this is the welfare issue that we're facing because we've confined these sows into individual pens, then if we provided them space to turn around and we were provided them the ability to move more freely and to socialize, then that should be an acceptable sow housing system. Unfortunately, I'm not so sure from the activist standpoint that the individual stall is truly a welfare issue. Because in their minds, it's truly an issue that is driven by emotion and perception, not science. However, as a scientist, it is about obligation to the well-being of that sow. And I want to just get off track for just a moment. When we talk about welfare, we're not talking about rights. And welfare does not equal animal rights. Um, welfare does not equal animal behavior. Okay? These are misconceptions. People believe that when you're talking about the welfare of a sow, you're talking about the rights of a sow. People think when you're talking about behavior that you're talking about the welfare of the sow. Behavior is just a way for us to assess the coping ability and the adaptability of that sow in a particular environment. It does, welfare addresses the concern for the well-being of the individual animals. Okay? It's unrelated to those perceived rights of an animal. Animal welfare should be concerned with physical and mental state of being and the proper treatment of animals. It is our obligation to keep these animals and care for them appropriately. Good husbandry practices. Okay? We should abide by the five freedoms, and that is the freedom from thirst, hunger, malnutrition, freedom from discomfort due to the environment, freedom of pain, injury, and disease, and fear and distress, but also the freedom to express normal behaviors for that species. This is probably the most difficult for us to assess, and I think that's one of the reasons that the activists say that a sow in an individual stall develops compulsive behaviors because she bites on those bars, or she sham chews. How do we know that those aren't normal behaviors that that species chooses to express? Okay. It's also about ethical and moral obligations. We must provide environments and care for these animals so that we do minimize those negative effects on their well-being and improve their adaptability. We have to base our decisions and changes on the scientific pr principles, not on perceptions, not on emotions, and not on disinformation. We have to make these decisions and changes based on the specific species that we're dealing with. Okay? A gestating sow is very different than a nursery pig and so forth. Okay? But I can tell you even in some of the large grow finish farms that I've been on, that you still see some of these behaviors that a sow shows in her own environment. These are animals that are in large groups, they can socially interact, but you will still find, you will still find animals that are bar biting, and you will still find, even though they have all this space they want, they consolidate themselves and utilize very little space within that environment. So what does the science indicate? Without the science, I truly believe that the consequences may be greater. Okay? If we don't have the knowledge and understanding of what impact the various components of a sow housing system has on the sow's well-being, we may come to the wrong conclusions and make the wrong decisions. 
And with this phenomenon that's going on where all these um, companies like McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King and so forth are forcing producers to make these changes, they're forcing producers to make changes based on emotions and perceptions. We still don't have a system that has been optimized that truly enhances that sow's well-being. It's kind of what happened in Europe that was driven they came to the wrong conclusions and, the wrong and they made the wrong decision and it led to laws which they banned the use of the gestation stall over there. Okay? They basically used behavioral measures only. They let public perception and emotions drive. And I will show you some slides where those, that law has created greater welfare problems than they had before those laws went into effect. So when you go through the literature and simply over the years, the past 10, 20 years, what you will find is a comparison. Simply, people that have compared sows kept in individual crates or stalls to sows in groups. Okay? And what you will find is that sows in stalls oftentimes will perform better than sows in groups. And on the next slide, there are times where sows and groups will perform better than sows and stalls. The most um, consistent measure has been reproductive efficiency. The sows and stalls have a shorter wean to estrus interval. They've been shown to have a greater farrowing rate, but, and they've also been shown to have reduced reproductive failure. From a piglet performance standpoint, sows and stalls compared to groups have been shown to have lower mortality rate, improved number born alive than wean, and heavier litter weaning weight. On the other hand, others have shown the same in groups. Groups have been shown to have greater farrowing rate, similar reproductive efficiency as sows and stalls. They've been shown to have more piglets born alive, re um, reduced, but they've also been shown to have reduced piglet uh, body weight. So many of these, they've either been shown to have similar um, performance to sows and stalls versus um, those in gr um, groups. And there's also been a lot of science to show that there are no differences among sows that are kept in stalls versus those that are kept in groups. Okay. Here's just a snapshot of some data that we published in uh, the Journal of Animal Sciences in 2007, where we essentially compare our, our control with sows and stalls to those in groups. And we gave them different floor space allowances. We gave them 15, 25, or 35 square feet per sow. And as you can see, the difference is the red, um, where there's red, those are the, that's the difference. And you can see it's all over the place. Sometimes those in stalls perform better than those in groups. And sometimes those in groups, depending on the floor space allowance they have, perform better than those in stalls. Okay? We also found a parity interaction. I will tell you that there didn't seem to be any impact on the gilts. It didn't matter if the gilts gestated in a pen with 35 square feet. It didn't matter if she gestated in an individual stall. If there was a treatment by parity interaction, it occurred most often among parity two, three, and four sows. Okay. Here's a study um, that was across six cycles. Um, uh, actually that Harold Ganyu at Prairie Swine Center in Canada. And he shows the differences between static and dynamic groups and whether pre and post implantation. And he has parity one, parity two, and then mature sows. And he shows that across, that whether you house them in a dynamic versus a static group or you move them in pre or post implantation, there has an impact on the farrowing rate of these animals. Back in October, there was a commercial farm producer that actually ran a study on trickle feeding. And his data showed that there are differences depending upon where they are in gestation. He showed that in early and mid gestation, there was a lot of fight fighting and there was some lameness and there were very few returns. Um, as we get into mid-gestation, there's still some aggression, there's still minor lameness, but now you start seeing some leg injuries. And by late gestation, there were a lot of lame, there was about 3.5% animals that were lame and had leg injuries. He shows that production was similar 
and that um, his overall take home message was that mixing is not a, um, a recommended production measure and that this type of system, a group housing system with trickle feeding takes a lot of management. And that was the common theme at that particular um, conference was that those that were talking about these various group housing systems is that the management is extremely intense. So is it as simple as removing stalls and making pens? Okay. It's really not that simple. There are so many components that make up a group housing system and there are a lot of components that make up an individual housing system. It's not that easy. Okay. This is just a snapshot of a um, system comparison where there was a study conducted where over time they looked at the ease of management, management training, and the protection for the sow. The more asterisk is um, very good, so one asterisk is poor, um, more than uh, four asterisks is very good, and then the, intens the intensity of management, moderate is one X to very intense is three X's. And so they went through and they compared an individual stall system with the different group systems that are out there and how you can see that it's, the management is much easier in a stall system than let's say an electronic sow feeding group system in which you maintain static groups. And once again, the management of training. And of course, the, there are the stall systems, the free access stall system which allows the sow to protect herself that's why you have a very good or a high rate of the sow having the ability to protect herself. Okay. Group housing is not a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. It's extremely complex and there are many factors. There's the physical components of the system, there's the animal itself, and there's the management components of that system. It's very difficult. Okay. Why? Because not all the pieces fit perfectly together or even acceptably at times. We have not figured out how to put the jigsaw puzzle together yet. There are so many pieces which include but are not, limit, but are not limited to this. We have indoors versus outdoors, dry lot versus pasture, group size, floor space allowance. How do you manage them? Static versus dynamic, feeding system. When do you move them in? Pre or post implantation. And then there are many other physical management components not to leave out genetic component of all of this. Okay. How should group kept sows be managed? We don't really have all those guidelines. The best that I could do was there was some recommendations by the AVMA and it said you should try to house them so that you minimize aggression and competition. You protect them from environmental extremes and other factors. You have to provide them feed and water. How do you do them? That Do you floor feed them? Or do you use one of these feeding systems? And then you should allow them to express normal behaviors. But what are normal behaviors? Okay. Other additional management strategies that have been recommended are small groups. You keep them in static. Larger groups can be dynamic, but you should move them to new pens. And that um, uh, feeding systems, you should allow them to sort and establish groups based on their eating, meaning the speed of eating. Um, how, what is their social hierarchy and things like that. That's about the best information we can give a producer right now as far as guidelines. Okay. If we do switch, what are the alternatives? I believe that we should learn from experience. I think science should drive a lot of the choices, but we also should learn from experience. I had the opportunity to go on a trip um, in November of 06 to Europe and it, we were able to visit several farms and talk to producers primarily in Germany and Denmark and it was very interesting the new the young producers who had no choice of how they were going to keep their sows because they were impacted by the legislation that the gestation stall has to be gone by 2012 they loved group housing those producers that had been doing it a very long time were very resistant to the changes that had to be made. We talked with a group of Ger um, people in Germany and they are just extremely dissatisfied with electronic sow feeding group housing system. 
They feel that reproductive efficiency has been reduced dramatically, that in fact they probably have to breed about 15 or 20 percent more sows just to have a complete group. One of the German producers said to us that when he saw the individual stall system in the United States, he thought to himself, that's how sows should be kept. The problem is, over in Europe, it really was not about the individual stall as we know here in the United States. It really started with what they called the tether system, where they were neck tethered and then put into an individual box, as they refer to it. It wasn't about a sow in a two by seven individual crate. It was about a sow that had a collar around her neck as well as being confined to an individual box. And that started in Sweden. And so now it becomes the um, misunderstanding or the interpretation of words, okay? So what the Germans have tried to do is they developed a free access stall system. They took out all their tethers. And in fact, you can see a lot of the tethers hanging through these um, facilities that have been retrofitted and the sows like to chew on them um, because they're just hanging over the fence posts or whatever. And what they like to do is they have this system called a free access stall system. And it gives them the opportunity to control feed intake. So they have these stalls and the animal can come and go as she pleases. And she will lock herself into the system and then she can back out, move down an alleyway. Okay? And if she wants to socially interact, she will. I will tell you that we, I spent a lot of time observing this system. And even though there was 40 sows, let's say, in one of these systems, because their farms are not very big, the, the largest farm over there is 1,000 sows. But on average, they have about three to 500 sows per producer over there. And on some of these larger farms where they did have a thousand sows, they would have them in groups of 40. And the majority of the time, those sows spent in those individual stalls. And if they did come out, they came out in groups of five, three to five. And no more than that. I mean, they didn't all come out at once. And in fact, there, I asked the producer several times and I said, you know, how much time do you think they spend outside that stall? And he basically said, probably 90 plus percent of their time is spent in that individual stall. And there's still certain ones that really don't choose to come out. Denmark probably held the same, the, when we talked to the Danish producers, they probably held the same, um, those that had been in the industry for a very long time, they were gonna hold on to their individual crates as long as they possibly could. The difference over there with group housing is they have common genetics. They simply have a, a white cross over there. They don't have a lot of these genetic lines and it's consistent from one farm to the next, okay? Their production is very different as well. They don't take their animals to as heavy a, a market weight as we do and so forth. There were several farms that were group housing, um, electronic sow feeding, that reported they had an over 90% farrowing rate and more than and approximately 11 plus piglets per sow um, weaned. These were very fine-tuned systems. In fact, some of them were producing about 28, 29 sows, piglets per sow per year um, overall. The thing that was startling about this is when you start really looking through the data is that um, their, their pre-weaning mortality rate is extremely high. There were a lot of sows that had probably 16 plus piglets per sow, and they're weaning about 11, okay? The systems where they had over 90% 90, 90 farrowing rate, these systems were extremely fine-tuned. It wasn't just about the, the electro groups, electronic sow feeding, it was about management and all the other environmental components. This man used um, photo period management, um, he only hired people within Denmark to manage his farms and they knew everything about these animals. They were, the management was very intense at this particular facility. And the unknown about this is, and this is something that a lot of the Europeans are very concerned with, what are the long-term consequences of these group housing systems? Because I will tell you that most of the farms we visited, we saw about two parodies and that was it. So how do we keep the gestation, gestating sow? I think pork producers are faced with a dilemma because there are no guidelines. 
We have not, as scientists or as an industry as a whole, we have not optimized or found an alternative system, okay, that enhances that well-being because if we enhance the well-being of that sow, we can sustain, it is about the sustainability of pork production. So how do we solve this problem? Do we give in? Do you guys just start phasing out the gestation stall and move into groups? Do we take advantage of this opportunity? I mean, this is an opportunity for, or is it a problem? Okay. Here's some of the alternatives. You can feed them on the floor, the ground if they're just in on a dirt lot, or you can provide stall feeding. This is probably the simplest, the least costly. Um, you can effectively achieve average um, feed intake, but it's going to be variable. <coughs> Because, as many of you know, if you do have sows, the more dominant animal is going to get the most feed, especially if you just scatter the feed on the floor. The problem with this is that the sow is competitive in, in nature. Okay? You're going to probably have to provide her more space if you're going to ground feed her or feed her on the floor. You're going to have to distribute that feed differently. Um, you're going to probably have to make a lot of adjustments. You're going to have to really be fine-tuned about the body condition scores of those sows so that you can provide the sows that have a lower body condition score with more food feed. You'll have to regroup. Okay? Feeding stalls can minimize this, um, but you still have some of the aggressive nature because once one sow is done, unless you lock her in, she's going to come and knock and push the other one out. So you still can't feed these individual rations. You could use a single drop feeding system. Um, this is one drop across a wide area. You still see a lot of increased aggression, especially around eating time, and then you get some stealing, stealing of the feed. There was a paper published in 2006 that showed that there were no differences between a single drop and a trickle feeding system. Um, and others have shown that you do still see an increase in threats, attacks, and fights in these particular systems. Okay. The feed, this is an example of a feed, trickle feeding system that we saw in Europe. And I just wanted to show you these slides because I wanted to show you how variable the body condition score of these animals were. Okay. To me, that is a welfare issue. Those animals, you can see the very thin sow in the middle, and you can see the very fat sows. And that fat sow started off at the very first feeder. And then when she was done with all of her feed, she just starts pushing the other animals out. And these were in small groups. There were six to eight um, sows in each of these groups, and they received about 1.5 kilograms over a 15-minute period two times a day. Okay? Um, it's supposed to minimize the boss sow, but she still does get all the feed. Your const this producer was constantly regrouping, and his body condition score, as you can see, is very variable. Now, there are ways to solve this problem. You can vary the rate at which the feed is being dropped. Okay? The slowest animals can consume. That provides an opportunity for those slowest animals to consume their feed. Um, and then, or you can sort into groups based on their feed requirements and how fast they eat. We saw a lot of electronic sow feeding systems over in Europe. These are pictures from Europe as well. Most often they were in groups of more than 30. Um, there was one ESF or electronic sow feeding system per 40 sows. It allows you to control that individual feed intake. Um, however, there still is a lot of fighting that goes on. The um, number of um, lesions and vulva biting were astronomical in several, on several of these farms. Um, management. It's really important. One of the things that I think we've lost sight of, especially in the United States, is they, Europe has eliminated the gestation stall, but they do use it for four to five weeks post-breeding. And that is acceptable, and that is part of their guidelines. So we, found, we saw over in Europe the electronic cell feeding group system being used two different ways. Those that kept them in stalls for four to five weeks and then moved them into groups, and those that kept moving them in post-breeding. My question is, should the stall really go? There is some really um, 
recent data showing that welfare challenges to the sow changes as she goes through the different stages of, of production. Okay? There was a paper published in 2006 that showed that sows in groups, very early on in gestation, you get these increased in scratches. There's a lot of fighting that goes on. So you see a higher estrus return, and they also have higher cortisol concentrations early on in gestation. Cortisol is a classical measure of stress. Okay? In this same paper, they showed that the welfare challenges for the sow in the stall occur in late gestation. And this is where they saw an increased incidence in lameness. Our paper that we published in 2007, we saw this as well in um, the lesion and the scratches. What we saw was that early on when we first formed the groups, that lesion scores increased astronomically. Till about day 10 to 14, putting them, forming the groups. Then they plateaued and they started to increase once again towards late gestation, towards the end of gestation. So if we have to manage sows differently through the different phases of the reproductive cycle or pregnancy, gestation, then should we let that, sow, that stall go? I think that we have to try to save the stall if the data tells us that we might need it for those first four to five weeks post-breeding. However, I don't think we can keep the, stall, the current stall. I think that we do need to develop a modified stall system, but we don't know. Is it that we need to improve it so the sow isn't able to turn around? Does turning around really improve her welfare? We don't know that. We don't know that that sow needs to turn around. She may want to turn around. She may need to turn around. We don't know. But to say that the stall is bad because a sow cannot turn around is not a valid um, is not a valid uh, conclusion. Would increasing the width and the length of that sow, of that um, gestation stall, provide better welfare environment for the sow? Would allowing that sow to socially interact and or more freely provide, would that, or move more freely, would that provide a better welfare or more welfare friendly environment for that sow? Scientifically, we have to improve the system. Okay? But just giving in and saying, let's phase it out. Um, we ha might need it for a time period. There were problems with the gestation stall even back in 1989. Curtis reported that the average of this, that in 1989, that standard gestation stall could accommodate the average sow. That was in 1989. Even back in 1989, although it could accommodate her, there was still, it still limited her ability to make normal postural adjustments. Okay? More recently in 2004, McGlone et al. reported that less than 40% of the sows fit into the standard gestation stall. That means without her protruding, being able to lie in full recumbency, and so forth. And this finding was within groups on the same farm, and it was also between farms within the same production system. He also showed that the majority of those sows, I mean, that body depth of that sow increases from mid-gestation to late gestation about 1.2 millimeters per day. There was an opportunity back in the late 80s, early 90s, called the, uh, the sow, a stall that would allow the sow to turn around, okay, without difficulty. It's been called the turnaround crate, it's been called the uh, freedom crate, so forth. But the industry at that time chose not to adopt that, okay? The idea is, would an adjustable stall be a more acceptable solution? Okay? An adjustable stall can, can accommodate that ever-changing sow. As she increases 1.2 millimeters per day throughout mid to late gestation, the stall can go with her if that's what she needs. That's not been developed. Okay? The other opportunity is the free access stall. 
This allows the set hall to choose. She can choose the social group she wants to be in, and she can choose whether she wants to be isolated or whether she wants to be within a group. I think it's apparent that we need to change, but are we ready to change? Are we ready to throw in the towel and just say, yes, we're going to phase out gestation stalls? Scientifically, we haven't evaluated the specific aspects that we, that, of a housing system, whether it's an individual housing system or a group housing system, that truly meets the needs and wants of that sow. There has been very few differences that have been identified today that directly correlate with improved well-being. One of the most striking, um, I guess, eye-opening experiences for me in Europe was for so long we have used reproductive efficiency as our measure of well-being. So we've said, okay, um, sows and stalls, reproductive efficiency or farrowing rate is the same as those in groups and vice versa. But when I saw the lesions and the fighting that went on in those group housing situations, it really turned on a light bulb for me. Because I had a very wise reproductive physiologist who's kind of retired at the University of Illinois, and he's probably 70, 80 years old, that told me one day that a sow will do whatever it takes to give birth to that litter. She will almost sacrifice herself. Okay? These fights, are tr these fights are just incredible. I mean, these, we're talking about a genetic line that has been selected for its mothering ability, that have const I mean, consistent genetics, simple white crosses, and these animals truly beat each other up. I've watched them knock these sows down. They stay down on their sternum. They don't get up, okay? But they still have a litter, and so we've come to the conclusion that it's okay to put those animals in these groups. And we have not yet identified the pieces that are most critical to an optimized housing system. Okay? Yeah, there are pluses and minuses of all systems out there. We have the so-called advantages of in-groups where we have the freedom of movement, they have the opportunity to socially interact, and they also can choose their own microenvironment. They can choose where they want the, the pen mates that they want to interact with. However, in group housing, there are these so-called disadvantages. Early on, we have a lot of aggression. For the duration of the gestational period that they're in these groups, there's a lot of social tension. That has long-term consequences on those animals. Those animals that are on the lower end of the hierarchy are experiencing a lot of social tension. And you get a lot of variability in the body condition scores, and there's a lot of injuries. And if that system, if the group housing system fails, I think sow welfare is worse than it is in an individual stall. Okay? Poor management is poor welfare, and it's unethical. And we saw a system like that. We had a guy over there that he still was claiming he had a 90% farrowing rate. His pit had been, had not, his pit had built up. The environment was awful in there. There was a lot of mucking. The sows looked like Holstein cows, and half of them should have been shot. And that was all about management of that system. And he said, I don't know how I'm going to clean out the, the pit. And it had been like that for over six months. But he was still had a 90% farrowing rate, so that wasn't of concern to him. Okay? We have to learn from others. We have to learn from what's happened over in Europe. Okay? If we learn from, I mean, has moving these sows simply from these individual stalls into groups improved their well-being? Do they really have better welfare? Is this better welfare than that sow that's combined to that 2 by 7 crate? Those scratches on the right-hand side, I watched that happen. It happened in about two and a half minutes. She had not one scratch on her. After about five minutes, she had just blood gushing because this was a group, and this is a farm that had over 90% farrowing rate. Okay? When it goes bad, it goes bad. And these are just pictures. You get a lot of abnormal behavior. Um, this is that system where we, um, the pit had, that someone pulled the wrong, so all the solid had built up. The solid was literally to the slats. Okay? The minute I walked in that building, I knew something was wrong, and we hadn't even gone into the gestation building yet. 
and I started peeking in the windows and I saw um, in the um, in the farrowing rooms these sows that looked like they'd been milked to death and they had only been in there they had just had their piglets okay so our lesions is vulva biting aggression high lesion scores abnormal behaviors and what we I like to call oral nasal facial behaviors instead of stereotypies that means the sow's doing something with her snout or her mouth are those really better indicators that the welfare is better okay in conclusion my take-home message is it's not that simple don't abandon ship okay we'll learn from this experience and hopefully optimize um, we know that there are advantages and disadvantages we also know that if one factor goes bad the welfare is worse than a sow in an individual stall it does take superior management and better training its skilled husbandry is the key factor we have to identify, characterize, and optimize those factors that will truly enhance the welfare of that sow. It's not a jigsaw puzzle. These pieces do not fit together often, and these pieces do influence one another. Okay? It could be a domino effect. We have that dominance hierarchy. Okay? Sows establish a hierarchy. What influence is that? Group size, floor space allowance, how you manage it, the type of feeding system. Okay. We know right now that individual and group house systems can perform equally. There's no doubt about that. But not one really has been identified that performs superior to the other. Few differences have been identified that directly correlate with the improved well-being of that gestating sow. Housing systems are extremely complex. Don't abandon ship. It's not as simple as removing those stalls and designing pens. Why? Because we haven't found that a system that improves her well-being. Okay? We need to know, does the sow really need to or want to turn around? And does the sow really need to or want to socially interact?